Thank you, Lucy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar on flow cytometry. We appreciate your time and hope it's not too inconvenient for you. As Lucy said, in the next hour or so, we would like to give you an introduction to this exciting technique. First, I would like to start off with an overview, how, to, how flow cytometry can be used, including the basic protocols. Then I will briefly explain the science behind the acquisition of data and finish with the analysis of the results and potential troubleshooting. So for those of you who are not familiar with flow cytometry, what is it? Flow cytometry is a powerful technique that is used to study individual cells or particles in heterogeneous populations. It allows you to measure multiple parameters rapidly and simultaneously. Furthermore, cells can be separated using a cell sorter. This subdiscipline of flow cytometry is often referred to as fluorescence activated cell sorting, or in short, FACS. Due to its versatility, flow cytometry is widely used in basic and clinical research. The research areas which flow cytometry is used in include the investigation of certain cell surface markers, as well as intracellular markers or fluorescent proteins, for example. It also is used in the analysis of the DNA content of a cell, and much, much more, as you can see from this list. I don't want to read the whole list to you, but would rather like to give you a flavor of what can be done with flow cytometry. Flow cytometry evolved from the analysis of blood cells in leukemia patients, and today it is still used to phenotype the cells of the immune system in various experimental settings, such as vaccination studies. Flow cytometry can also be used to characterize cancer cells from a solid tumor and tumor cells that may be circulating in the body. The cells that can be analyzed with flow cytometry can go from very small, like bacteria, up to very large, or even whole organisms. Amazingly, flow cytometry is indeed used to study certain mutants of C. elegans. In these studies, the whole worm is flushed through the flow cytometer in order to check for expression of the marker of interest. Because flow cytometry is such a powerful technique, it has been and is being used more and more. This is illustrated in this graph, which shows the number of publications mentioning flow cytometry of fax over the last 35 years. And you can see the number is steadily increasing. But how do you actually utilize flow cytometry? Flow cytometry is a three-step process of A, a proper sample preparation, B, the preparation of the instrument, followed by C, the data analysis step. Today, I would like to point out what is most important for each of these steps. This means I will talk about the sample preparation and the staining protocols. I will speak about how to set up the instrument, including the compensation process and which controls are required. And I will briefly mention how data are usually analyzed and displayed. For flow cytometry, it is imperative that you prepare a single cell suspension. This is because so-called doublets, cell clumps, or dead cells in your sample can generate misleading data. In case you are analyzing blood samples, which basically is already a single cell suspension, the blood should be collected in tubes that support your experimental setting. For immunophenotyping, for example, collection tubes with EDTA or citrate as anticoagulant are recommended. Here I suggest to check with the manufacturer of the collection tube for more details. You also may want to consider the lysis of the red blood cells. If you're analyzing cell culture cells or tissue samples, you can use enzymatic methods or a tissue homogenizer to prepare the single cell suspension. In general, it is useful to filter all samples using a 50 micrometer nylon mesh. 
and also to reduce unspecific signals or staining due to dead cells, it is always advisable to ensure viability of the cells you're investigating. The next step is staining of the cells or particles. As for most procedures, there are direct and indirect staining protocols, as well as a protocol for staining intracellular proteins. I would like to start off with the direct staining protocol. As mentioned earlier, to ensure viability of the cells, it is recommended to keep the cells on ice during the preparation and staining of the procedure. A typical sample contains 10 to the power of 5 to 10 to the power of 6 cells, which are usually resuspended in a volume of 100 microliter in a tube or a round bottom plate. Depending on the sample preparation procedure, the cells should be washed. This is usually done using a buffer like PBS that includes serum or BSA. Then you spin down the cells and remove the supernatant. The next step is a blocking step. As for many other protocols, this can be done by adding a buffer with 1 to 10% serum or BSA to the cell pellet. To improve the blocking, the blocking reagent can also be included in the dilution buffer of the primary antibody, which in most cases might be sufficient. Again, this step is followed by washing and centrifuging the cells. The third step is incubating the cell pellet with the primary antibody. The optimal concentration of the antibody will need to be determined by titration. The aim with this is to obtain the maximal contrast between the specific signal and the background staining. In this direct staining protocol, the primary antibody is fluorochrome conjugated. The most frequently used fluorochromes are the fluorescent-based by FITSI and phycoerythrin, or PE, but as you can see, there are many, many more available. In general, the sample is incubated for 15 to 45 minutes at 4 degrees Celsius, and in order to protect the fluorochrome from photobleaching in the dark. Again, this step is followed by washing and centrifuging the cells. The following step, the fixation, is an optional step, as there are many pros and cons for the fixation of cells. An advantage is the prevention of infection, for example with contagious diseases from patients whose blood samples are investigated. Fixation can also be convenient, as fixed samples need not be analyzed immediately after staining, but can be stored for some time in the fridge, for example. A disadvantage of fixing your cells, though, is that you cannot exclude dead cells, as the fixation process kills virtually all cells. Fixation also alters the light scatter profiles and may increase the autofluorescence, so, so you might need to adjust the instrument settings. If you decide to go ahead and fix the cells, you can either use alcohols such as ethanol or methanol. These reagents can work for most protein antigens. Um, certainly, they are the fixation reagent of choice for DNA measurements. You could alternatively perform the fixation with formaldehyde or paraformaldehyde. Although this is a cross-linking fixative, it generally works well with most antigens. And finally, before running the sample on the flow cytometer, it needs to be resuspended in a minimum of 250 microliter of buffer, depending on the type of assay you're performing or the machine you have available. To avoid fading of the fluorescence, keep the stained cells in the dark at 4 degrees Celsius and analyze as soon as possible. Also, remember to vortex the sample immediately before the run to ensure an evenly mixed single cell suspension. Now, this was the direct staining protocol for flow cytometry. Now, I would like to briefly talk you through the indirect staining protocol. This protocol starts off with the same steps as the direct protocol. So first, you would prepare your single cell suspension. And secondly, comes the blocking of the samples if required. The third step is again incubation with the primary antibody. 
In contrast to the direct staining protocol, the primary antibody in this case is not labeled with a fluorochrome. It may be conjugated to biotin, though, as illustrated um, in these pictures. Following a washing step, the pellet is then incubated with a secondary antibody. This is the antibody which is labeled with fluorochrome, such as FITSI or PE. If you have used a biotin conjugated primary, you would need to incubate with a fluorochrome conjugated avidin or strapped avidin. The following steps are as before. After washing is an optional fixation step before running the sample on the flow cytometer. <laughs> 